so we've spoken about the heavyweight prospect on the channel before, uh, Izu Ugono. I guess the guy is best known because he fights on Joseph Parker undercards. Um, obviously, Joseph Parker is the standout boxing sensation of New Zealand at present. And in a sense, it's very smart by uh, Team Ugono to have positioned him where he is. Because obviously, Joseph Parker has a huge amount of fans who tune in uh, to see him, who enjoy heavyweight boxing, who enjoy big knockouts. And on the undercard, you've got this guy, Ogono, who appears to be operating in a, a very similar mould, you know, getting rid of opponents early, looking fairly devastating, looking like a, a pretty pretty exciting prospect himself. So it's very sensible. I know he's got the same sort of training team as Joseph Parker and the same setup in that sense. So on the face of it, he's well positioned. Um, I did a video on this guy some time ago, probably you know, six months, nine months ago, where I said pretty much that I was still on the fence about Ogonu. Uh Since then, I've had so many comments on my videos and so many emails about the guy and, you know, have I been checking him out? Have I been keeping up to date with his progress? And the simple answer, if I'm honest, is, is possibly not. He's someone who's kind of slipped off my radar slightly. But I got so many messages about him, I thought I'd have to check him out. So I watched his fight against uh, Will Quarry. And I watched his most recent fight. Um, the guy's name may have been Vincento Sandez, but I've probably got that horribly wrong. I'll uh, I'll put it in the video title when I'm uploading this. So I've basically I watched a few of his early fights, and I've I've got a little bit of memory of him from them. And I've just before filming this, I've sat down to watch his two most recent fights. Before not his two most recent fights. I think he had one in between the two, but two of his three most recent fights, both of which ended fairly quickly um, and I wanted to put up some thoughts about him and his development this guy I can see why he's generating some momentum in the boxing arena because heavyweight boxing fans like knockouts they like devastation and this guy has got a string of very very early knockouts you know second round knockouts first round knockouts he clearly carries um, some power even if it is at a certain level um, and he does some things well enough, you know, it's, it's not that he's purely power, you know, he seems to be very, very agile, he seems to be in tremendous physical condition, you know, he's obviously a very uh, insight guy who takes his training very, very seriously, and that's commendable. Um, but, as you can possibly tell by the tone of me in this video, I'm not entirely convinced. Let me say that if you're operating at a very, very low level in the heavyweight division, and if you're a school fighter, you know, somebody with boxing education, someone with skills, and if you're somebody who's got that schooling and you combine it with being in tremendous physical condition, you combine it with natural athleticism and agility and natural power, you are going to be able to take out the lower echelons of the heavyweight division because, you know, as we know, the lower echelons of the heavyweight division are people who drive taxis for a living or people who work in pubs as doormen for a living. It's not like other divisions, you know, you get you get a lot of guys like that in the heavyweight division. Now, it's not to say that Izu Gono has been fighting doormen or fighting taxi drivers, but if you're honest, even the most hardened Izu Gono fan would struggle to say that any name from his resume is a top 50 heavyweight. Um, you know, he's been fighting guys, and it's not a problem that he's been fighting these guys, because guys who are beginning their heavyweight education as a boxer, I know he's got extensive kickboxing background, but... You, know, you do fight these guys, but the level of opposition he's been fighting is uh, low. You know, fighting guys who've had less than 10 fights, fighting guys who've already had you know, substantial amounts of losses on their record, etc. So he's done what he's had to do against them. He's taken them out. What he hasn't done is faced the more sort of internationally known um, opponents. So you look at Joseph Parker. Uh, I guess he's the easiest comparison, seeing as they fight on the same bills. You know, names like Brian Minto. I mean, Brian Minto isn't a spectacular fighter by any stretch. But if you look at it as the Class A fighters being the top heavyweights in the world, the Class B fighters being the contenders, the Class C fighters being the recognised journeyman, is it who has been fighting the Class D fighters, the ones you necessarily haven't heard of internationally? Whereas Joseph Parker, who's... Resume is, again, you know, far from perfect in terms of the level of opposition. Has been facing that sort of well-known journeyman. I mean, Nascimento, 
um, Brian Minto, Sermon Williams. Um, he's even stepped up sometimes to sort of more lower end contender level, you know, lower end class B when he's fought the likes of uh, Bowie Tupu, Jason Petaway. Um, I forget who the other name is that he, he fought. Jakob Saglam. You know, he's fought guys who are there and thereabouts, top 50, top 40, top 60, that sort of level. I'm not seeing that with Izu Gono. Now, again, that's not a criticism of Agono. He can only fight what's put in front of him. And he's looked good in against these guys. But, I question how he will do against the upper opposition. We see it time and time again in heavyweight, opposition, uh, heavyweight contests where a guy can look superb at the Class B sort of truck driver level. But then they slightly struggle when they step up to that Class C. Um, I did a video the other day on Andy Ruiz, the Mexican heavyweight prospect. He's a guy who looked absolutely devastating when he was having his early fights. You know, he stepped up and he fought the uh, Sergei Lyakovich, you know, not, not a top name at all, but suddenly he started to struggle. Suddenly the power hadn't transcended up in class. Suddenly the, the hand speed wasn't enough. And um, I wonder whether Izu Gonu may struggle slightly as he moves up in class. Let, let me put it this way. Um, at this stage of his heavyweight development... I don't see him having the same potential upside as a Joseph Parker. I don't see him having the same potential upside as an Anthony Joshua, as a Huey Fury, as a Charles Martin. Um, and that's not to say, I mean, Ogonu could improve. And he could also step up his game for um, a better level of opponent. You know, I'm not saying that at this point I think his career's over and he may as well give up. You know, he's, he's clearly capable, he's clearly fit, he clearly carries power. I'm just questioning, would he be able to take on the top 10, top 20 of the heavyweight division in the next three or four years? You know, how do I see him doing against Brian Jennings? How do I see him doing against Bermain Stavern? How do I see him doing against Tony Thompson? And at this point, I think he's struggling. And uh, I'll give you a few reasons why I think he's struggling. Um, the jab. You know, I've seen people online talking about Izu Gono's jab. From what I've seen, and as I say, I haven't seen an exhaustive back catalogue of his work. You know, people out there who are watching this video will, will know the guy far better than I do. But having watched, let's say, three or four of his fights, I'm unconvinced about his jab. You know, I just watched the uh, quarry fight before making this video. And if, if you've got time, it's only a two-round fight, go back and have a look at that and see if you can see what I mean here. The jab is not a forceful punt. I mean, you look at Vladimir Klitschko throwing a jab. It's the kind of jab that would snap someone's head back. Um, yeah, it's a battering ram. It's a dangerous punt. He uses it to engage an opponent's defence so that he's free to throw his big right hand or a, a left hook or something like that. For me, Gonu's jab is, is weak. It's flimsy. It's not very accurate. Um, it's more of a sort of range finder. And... I just think that the top class heavyweights and the top class prospects are showing a, a better jab. You know, I know it's only one element of the game, the jab, but he's quite a classic boxer. You know, he is a sort of guy who likes to operate behind a one-two. And if you're that kind of fighter at an early stage in your development, I think not having a real ramrod jab is potentially a negative. And I, I question the jab for Izu Gonu. Um, I also question him defensively. I mean, that quarry fight, if you look back to 20, 30 seconds before Ogonu, um stops quarry, uh, and he does stop him very well by certainly, but if you look at it, you'll notice that quarry, who I believe himself had less than 10 fights and a number of losses on his resume at the time, was able to land a heavy, heavy combination of punches on Ogonu. Um, You know, the camera, I watched it on, it was recorded ringside, uh, it didn't look like the most professional footage I've ever seen in my life. So, you know, I didn't exactly get to look at a slow-mo image of it. But you'll see these punches land very, very hard in the Gono. Um, you know, from the fighter with less than 10 fights and several losses. I mean, that's that's a concern at this stage. You, you don't want to see your prospects taking punches like that. And um, when he's hit, for me, the Gono has a tendency to back straight up. You know, he's not... Again, I... Uh, maybe I'm being harsh here. From the limited tape I've seen on him, he's not one who is an exceptional lateral mover. When punches come his way, his tendency is to straight, you know, go straight back. 
And he's getting away with it at this sort of level. Um, but as you move up in class, you're going to have opponents follow him. You're going to have opponents follow up with combinations from range. You're going to have opponents come low and get inside on him. Um, you know, he's going to have to develop more advanced lateral movement, more advanced defensive instincts. Because for me, when the fire is coming back at Agonu, he isn't the most natural heavyweight in the world. If you look at Tyson Fury, and uh, viewers will know that I'm a huge Tyson Fury fan, but if Tyson Fury is under fire, he's so instinctive, you know, shoulder comes up, he's rolling, he's leaning, he's bending, he makes it a very, very difficult, awkward target to hit. You know, he's moving side to side. Whereas for me, Agonu, he's kind of less instinctive when the fire's coming back at him. Uh, you know, I question that. Uh, I question his defence. Um, I question his jab. I question his lateral movement. Um, and I question the fact he backs straight up. I think finally, in terms of his offence, and his offence has looked good at this level, um, I do just wonder like, how many different tools he has in his locker. Because when I look at him, he, he seems to be like quite a good ABC boxer. You know, he does the basics well. Um, he, you know, offensively he seems strong, but relatively standard. I, I don't see him having, I'll give you, again, and this is, we're being critical here because we're comparing him to the top heavyweight prospects out there. But does he have the punch variety of a Joseph Parker? You know, does he throw a hook like Parker? Does he throw an uppercut like Parker? Does he put beautiful combinations together with hand speed like Parker? Does he change levels like Parker? Does he go on the inside like Parker? I mean, I just don't see it in him. Again, that's not... Not, not all prospects can be Joseph Parker's or Anthony Joshua's. There has to be some slightly lesser prospects. And Agonu can go on to do some big things in the sport. You know, he's, he's still relatively young. I think he's still in his late 20s. He, he clearly carries power. He takes it seriously and he's athletic. But I'm just not so excited as it about him as the other guys out there. And all of these early knockouts, I can see how that generates momentum. But mark my words, at some stage when you face the better opposition, you need more than knockout power. Um, and when you face the better opposition, sometimes you find out that your knockout power that you've enjoyed your entire career isn't legit top 10 knockout power. Now, I'm not saying that will happen to Agono. I'm saying that will happen to every heavyweight. You know, you look at the biggest punches out there in history, Mike Tyson, Lennox Lewis, Muhammad Ali, uh, Vladimir Klitschko, George Foreman even. You know, they all ended up going rounds. They all ended up going rounds. And when your power isn't enough, slick defensive skills, world-class movement, punch variety, um, the ability to fight on the inside, the ability to box on the back foot, all of these things are key. Have I seen evidence that Agonu is as well-rounded as some of the other prospects? No. That's not to say he can't up his game. That's not to say he can't improve. And that's not to say better opponents won't bring more out of him. Just at this stage, I view him as a Category B heavyweight prospect. You know, you've got the A-grade guys. You've got your Anthony Joshua's, your Joseph Parker's, um, your Huey Fury's, Charles Martin. And then for me, you've got the guys who... I wouldn't be trusting with my mortgage, you know, Andy Ruiz, um, Izu Gonu, Dillian White off his recent fight, you know, there's the, the, there's just different levels of excitement for me. Let me know your thoughts, if you've enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up, apologies in advance to all the Kiwis um, that I've upset by making this video, uh, I've just got to give my honest thoughts and, uh, you know, as I say, it's no negative that this guy isn't necessarily at the same level as Joseph Parker at this stage. That's more of a, a positive for your, your main fighter in the heavyweight division. Thanks for watching.